Hey, welcome back to the channel, everybody. In this week's video, we're going to have Charles Judd explain to us, in fact, he's going to demonstrate the configuration of EAP, that's Extensible Authentication Protocol, on a Cisco Wireless LAN controller. After all, if we have a really large wireless environment, we probably don't want to be handing out a single shared secret key to everybody. That's not scalable. So what we can do instead is have every user have their own account. And Charles is going to show us how to set up a user account locally on the wireless LAN controller or point to a radio server that might have a database of users already and we can just leverage that. And by the way, as I record this on April 15th, 2020, Cisco just announced that we can now do online testing. It's proctored online testing. You're going to have a webcam and uh, there's going to be a proctor that's watching you take the exam, trying to cut down on cheating. But great news, we're no longer prevented from taking Cisco exams. And by the way, this training coming up today in this video, this is from our Encore video training series. And if you like this video, do me a favor and click on the like button down below and also subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of our weekly content. Now, let's join Charles as we take a look at how to set up extensible authentication protocol on a Cisco Wireless LAN controller. We're going to take a look now at how to configure EAP-based authentication, first using an external RADIUS server. The RADIUS server is going to be our AAA server where the user database is stored. So the first thing we're going to need to do is to configure the wireless LAN controller so that it recognizes the external RADIUS server. And we'll first do that by logging into the wireless LAN controller, which I've already done here. And you can see that that lands us at a main monitoring page with a summary. From there, we can choose the security page that's found along the top navigation menu. And then you can see that our first submenu on the left hand side is already expanded. And that's the submenu for AAA services. From there, you can see we have options for both Radius and TACAX Plus. And underneath the Radius option, which is expanded, we can choose the authentication submenu from there. That's going to allow us to define our external radius server. From there at the top right, we have a new button. So that's what we want to choose. We want to make a new server to define a new radius server. After I choose that, right up top, you can see that we have something called the server index or the priority. And the server with the lowest server index is going to be assumed to be the most preferred server for use with this wireless LAN controller. So if that server becomes unresponsive, then the wireless LAN controller is going to switch to the next lowest server index. So if you have multiple radius servers, you'll want to make sure that your primary server is configured with the lowest server index. Now in our case, I'm only going to configure a single instance of radius server, so we can leave that index priority value set to one. Next, we want to enter the radius server's IP address. In my case, I'll use the IP address 10.10.10.5. And next, we want to enter a shared secret key. The radius shared secret is used to make sure there is secure communication between a radius server and a radius client. And in this case, the client is going to be our wireless LAN controller. Now, at this point in the configuration, we would already have a shared secret key configured on the actual radius server. So here, you just want to make sure that that key matches when it's input on the wireless LAN controller. That's going to make sure there are no communication errors. Also notice that you can input that in either ASCII or HEX. Now, ASCII is the most common format for that, so I'm going to leave that be. And we'll enter the same shared secret key that is configured on the radius server itself. So we have that done. Next up, notice there is the key wrap option, and that is disabled by default. Now, what the key wrap does is it wraps the shared secret key with an AES encryption. So it's really strong. It encapsulates that shared secret with super strong encryption. And you can see it stated that this is designed for FIPS customers. And FIPS stands for Federal Information Processing Standards. These are cryptographic standards specified by the United States government. Now, these would be mandatory for any U.S. government employee computer. So any computer used for government work, that would need to be FIPS compliant. I'm going to leave that disabled in our example. And next, 
We want to check the port number. By default, Radius uses UDP port 1812 for authentication. That's already populated, as you can see, so we can leave that there. Now, if you do happen to have your Radius server configured for communication on another port for some reason, obviously you want to change that here as well so that they have communication. And finally, you can see that the server status is set to enabled, which is what we want. Now, if we had multiple Radius servers configured under here, that would allow you to easily disable a server. Maybe you had a server fail or maybe it needs servicing. You can simply click on that and change the status to disabled, and that will take that out of service temporarily. Once we have all of that populated, we can hit the apply button to save that. And we've now identified our external Radius server. We can see that listed here under the list of Radius authentication servers. The next thing we need to do is enable 802.1x authentication on our wireless network. Back along the top menu, we can see the WLANs menu near the left. So we want to choose that. And from there, we can see our SSIDs that are configured. I'm going to choose the corporate network. So I have a couple of SSIDs. I have a corporate and a guest. So I'll choose corporate. And from there, I'll select the security tab, the second tab from the left. If we look at these settings, you can see that the default settings that are in place are actually already going to take care of what we want to do. Layer 2 security, that defaults to WPA plus WPA2, so it is going to be WPA2 capable. And we can see that the WPA2 policy has a blue check mark, meaning that it is enabled. Also right below that, AES also has a blue check mark, so that means we are using the strongest security option here. And under the authentication key management area, we see the very top option is 802.1x. That is also already enabled. Now, if we have older clients, maybe they're not capable of 802.1x authentication, we could also enable PSK, pre-shared key. So that allows us to do that. But Ideally, in an enterprise environment, we don't want to do that, so we're going to leave that 802.1x authentication enabled. And that completes everything inside of this Layer 2 tab. Now, at the top, we can move over to the AAA Servers tab. And from here, we'll be able to see our list of configured Radius servers. By default, these are going to be populated according to the server index that you've given them when you configured the external server. So again, since we only have a single instance of a Radius server identified, that's all we see in this list. We see the IP address and the port number listed here in the dropdown. So we can choose that, and then we can go up and hit the Apply button on the top right. Notice that we do get a message here saying that that's going to temporarily disable our wireless network. So here's a pro tip. You don't want to do that during production. You'll have some very, very unhappy users. So in my case, in a lab environment, that's okay. I'm going to just go ahead and click the OK button, and then that's finished. And that's all we need to do to complete the configuration for EAP using an external Radius server. Now, maybe you have a smaller environment, or maybe you don't have a Radius server. In that case, you can use something called Local EAP instead. And Local EAP is going to use an authentication server that is actually built into the wireless LAN controller. So we can set that up by going back to the Security tab near the top, and now on the left menu structure, about halfway down, we see the local EAP option. So we want to choose that. That's going to expand the submenu, and we want to click Profiles. Notice that we don't currently have any profiles. I don't have local EAP set up yet, so we'll want to go to the right, and we'll want to click New to create a new profile. We'll want to give that a name. I'm just going to name that Local-EAP and we can hit the apply button. Now we can see our new profile listed in the local EAP profiles window. Now we want to actually click on the profile name and that's going to allow us to edit some of the attributes of that profile. And you can see all of the parameters that we have there. You see that we can actually choose which type of EAP we want to use. I'm going to choose protected EAP and I'm going to hit apply again. Now that we have a local EAP profile, we can go back to the WLANs menu near the top left. 
and we want to choose one of our networks. I'm going to choose again the corporate network and I'm going to go back to that security tab as well. And then I want to choose triple A servers under the sub tabs. The first thing we want to do, if we're using local EAP, we want to make sure that we don't have any external radius servers enabled here. And you see that we do actually have the radius server that we already configured, listed and enabled there. So what we want to do besides server one, we want to go and click in that drop down and we want to choose none. That's going to make sure that it's not looking for that external server instead. So we want to make sure that none of those are defined when we're using local EAP. Now, if we scroll down to the bottom of that window, you can see that we see the option for local EAP authentication. And of course, by default, that is disabled. So we can enable that simply by clicking the box and then the name of our profile that we set up already is populated in there. We only have the single local EAP profile that I made. If we had multiple profiles, again, you would be able to choose from those there. So it already populated the profile that we had in place. So that's good. And now we're going to go back up and choose the apply button. We're going to get that same warning again, letting us know that this is going to temporarily disable our wireless networks. We'll click OK. And then that's completed. The last thing we need to do for a local EAP is to actually configure our user database. So since we're authenticating locally, we actually need to have some local users stored on this wireless LAN controller. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to authenticate. So let's go under the security tab at the top again. And on the left, under the triple A menu that's expanded, if we look about halfway down, we'll see the local net users option. So let's click on that. And you see this is not populated with any users yet. We don't have any local users configured. So we can click the new button on the right and we can begin to configure our users in there for authentication. So I'll just put a test user in there. So I've created a user called test. I've created the password. I re-entered that and now we can choose a specific wireless network that they can be authenticated on. Notice that we can choose one of the SSIDs that we have configured already. So that's gonna allow them to be authorized access on a specific network. So in my case, again, I have the corporate and the guest network. I'll choose corporate and again, I'll click apply to apply that. You can see that we now have the user listed under our local net users. And that's the last thing we need to do to configure local EAP on the wireless LAN controller. If we go back to our main WLANs window and we see our list of networks here, if you look over on the right under security policies, notice that both of these networks display the auth 802.1x beside them under the security policies column. So this is how we can verify that both of these networks are in fact using EAP based authentication methods. We can also ensure from here that they are both in the enabled state and they are in fact in that state. So that's exactly what we would want to see. So that's a look at how we can configure EAP based authentication, both locally on a Cisco wireless LAN controller and using an external radius server.